Don B, and I'm going to be representing the first negative. Um, as my opponent mentioned, the Jacob Waterling Act of 1994 uh, passed a sex offender registry that was only available to law enforcement. However, this changed after the murder of seven-year-old Megan Conta, uh, which was committed by a man who kidnapped and sexually assaulted and murdered Megan, who also had two prior offenses for sexual assault, and he was living right across the street from that family, and the parents had no idea. So in this case, preventative action would have been key in preventing the child from being kidnapped and murdered and sexually assaulted. Um, in terms of the unfairness of Megan's law, an offender can actually be granted exclusion from the site if they meet the requirements of California Penal Code Section 29046E. In other words, if they haven't been convicted of any other offense or if it is a misdemeanor, then they can be granted exclusion from the public registry. Offenders are categorized according to the severity of the crime, moderate to high risk offenders. Offenders who are low risk information, who are low risk, um, their information is only available to law enforcement. And so only the people who have committed really severe crimes are gonna be available on the registry so that families are aware of who's living in their neighborhood. According to smart.gov, recidivism is conceptually <coughs> defined as the reversion to criminal behavior by an individual who was previously convic uh, convicted of a criminal offense. It reflects both the individual's recurrent failure to abide by society's laws and the failure of the criminal justice system to correct the individual's law-breaking behavior. According to the OLR research report by senior attorney Christopher Reinhardt, the three tiers of categorization, categorization are the risk assessment is done by the superior court judge. The top two tiers are placed on the internet, or internet registry. This establishes a frequency and length of time that sex offenders must remain in the registration system. Tier one is considered the least dangerous and least likely to recidivate or reoffend. They have to provide a person annual reports of their whereabouts for 15 years, and they can also get this term reduced by several years by fulfilling the clean record requirement of 115B of SORNA. Tier two is the moderate level, and these offenders have been convicted of sex trafficking, coercion and enticement, transportation with intent to engage in criminal sexual activity, abusive sexual conduct, use of a minor in a sexual performance, solicitation of a minor to practice prostitution and production, or distribution of child pornography. They are required to provide semi-annual in-person reports for 25 years. In regards to the example that my opponent presented of the man who couldn't get a job for, um, due to his registry for 25 years, these are the sorts of crimes that he's committed in, for him to have received the 25 year sentence. So these are pretty severe and they present a considerable threat to society and the safety of our children. Tier three is the most severe level. They have to provide quarterly in-person reports to confirm or update the registration information for the rest of their life. This is punishable by more than one year in prison and involves the kidnapping of a minor and more severe offenses. Unless the offender is a juvenile delinquent, in which case the registration period is 25 years if they maintain a clean record. And so if they're underage and, for example, committed a tier two or tier three offense, they're not required to stay on the registry for life. They still have a 25 year registration period, but there's still a fair amount of uh, judgment in terms of gauging their age the punishment. The citizens have a right to know if there is a sex offender living in their neighborhood in close proximity to their children because the rights and protection of innocent children to safety outweighs the rights of sex offenders to privacy. Police supply this information to schools and nurseries which allows the teachers to be more alert and aware so that they can be proactive to the potential risks to the children. This provides a wider net of safety for children where sex offenders can slip through the cracks. According to the Office of Justice Programs, only 2.5% of sexual assaults and 10% of serious sexual assaults resulted in an arrest, and only 29% of reported juvenile sexual assaults. This allows, the, uh, Megan, Megan's law allows the public to play an active role in protecting their children, where the law does not. Also, according to the Office of Justice Programs, a number of studies have found that sex offenders disclose in treatment or in surveys that they had committed a large number of sex crimes before they were first caught or arrested. Under conditions of guaranteed confidentiality, they found that only 3.3% of the self-admitted hands-on sex offenses, such as rape and child molestation, resulted in an arrest. 
And so these crimes are going on behind closed doors very frequently, they're just not caught. And so what the registry does is that it allows the public to be more proactive in protecting their families. Sex offenders are more prone than any other offender or criminal to reoffending upon re release from prison. So their recidivation rates are pretty high. The largest single study of sex offender recidivism, conducted by Langen, Schmidt, and DeRose in 2003, was published by the US Department of Justice, Bureau of Justice Statistics, examined the recidivis recidivism patterns of 9,691 male sex offenders released from prisons in 15 states in 1994. They used a three-year post-release follow-up period, re-arrest and reconviction rates for sexual and other crimes, and they were reported for the entire sample of sex offenders, as well as for different categories of sex offenders. Nearly four out of ten of the sex offenders in the study were returned to prison within three years of their release. So there's a high rate of them reoffending, and so if they're on the registry, then you can catch these reoffenders when they're living in your neighborhood, and you can check their emails to see who your children are talking to to see if that they are sex offenders because they have a high chance of reoffending once they already have done so. According to the same study, the sex crime rearrest rate was four times higher than the rate for non-sex offenders. Similar patterns were consistently found in other studies that compare sex offender and non-sex offender recidivism in 2003 and 1995. Megan's law itself is not intended to prevent offenders from reoffending. It is intended to notify the public where, how, and when sex offenders are in pro proximity to them and their families for awareness. So in that sense, it fulfills its purpose.